Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Saskia Vermeulen. I'm a Chancellor's Fellow at the Law School um, at the University of Strathclyde um, in Glasgow in uh, Scotland. And I'm going to present a work that I've been doing on um, customary law through a case study of the uh, saltwater collection uh, and the sea rights um, of uh, the all new uh, peoples. Before um, I'm going to go into the presentation, just a little bit of a warning. Um, if there would be Aboriginal people um, watching the presentation, that there will be images of um, the ancestors and um, sacred sites. Um, yeah, those images will be shown in the presentation. Just to give a little bit of um, background and the wider context of the work I'm doing on uh, customary law. So I'm actually interested in um, sort of the wider um, cultures of law. And I've been doing for the last 15 years, um, both empirical and theoretical work around ancestral land uh, right claims and particularly um, how different legal traditions are coming together both physically in the landscape but also how these different legal um, cultures are being um, represented, are coming together in court cases and how often there are clashes and conflicts when these different legal um, traditions are meeting both in the landscape and um, in court cases. And part of that friction that is being created uh, by different legal um, traditions, different legal um, families or cultures uh, meeting in, in these physical uh, kind of contexts is because we're dealing here with a very traumatic kind of legal history where only particular kind of legal traditions, legal cultures are being recognized as being formal uh, law and um, positivist legal concepts around um, landscape, around belonging, around um, claiming title are often hierarchically being um, positioned and, and, and subordinate other uh, ways of conceptualizing uh, law. Now within customary law, I'm very much interested in um, the intricate relationships between humans, non-humans, and more than humans. And with the latter, I particularly um, have in mind uh, the relationships with um, the ancestors, um, who are very important sources of law in um, most, if not all, uh, indigenous uh, people's cultures and legal traditions. And it's particularly that relationships between and, and between the humans, non-humans, and more than humans, which causes a lot of friction when um, indigenous peoples are presenting their, um, their laws in court cases around, um, for example, native title claims. So if we look into a bit deeper into the case study that I would like to um, present today on the saltwater collection, um, we need to place it within the wider context of native title claims and obviously particularly in the context of native title claims in um, Australia. And we see that in order for Aboriginal peoples to claim um, rights over their land, um, which they've lost um, through colonial um, dispossession and which is particularly a really burning kind of issue in, in settler um, colonies. Um, we see that the native, te the, nat sorry, the native Title Act of 93 um, requires that there is a substantial maintenance of the continuous connection between the laws and customs of contemporary claimants and their ancestors at the time of establishment of British sovereignty. So we see that there is a reference um, to, to the customs of um, Aboriginals um, in the form of contemporary claimants, but that there is a particular requirement that there needs to be uh, evidence of a continuous um, relationship. And often we see, and that is further specified in section 60, uh, 62, that in order to claim this kind of continuous relationship um, with, um, with the ancestors, 
and, and a place um, is that um, external boundaries of that relationship or the external boundaries of the claim and the existing tenures need to be presented um, on maps. So that's a very specific kind of requirements that we see it for native titles, not just in Australia, but in most um, settler colonies and also some of the work that I'm interested in in Southern Africa. We see this a similar um, kind of development that um, indigenous peoples need to produce maps where they can um, really show in um, through boundaries, through making claims through boundaries, um, that there has been this continuous relationship um, uh, with the land uh, throughout time. So uh, there is this issue of customary law that needs to be um, uh, presented and um, as probably will come clear through the three presentations that will be presented as part of, of these uh, podcasts is that customary law, um, it, there is not like a unifying definition what customary law is and we, we kind of have to deal as well with the problem that customary law has often been um, reformed and reconceptualized through to the meeting of different legal traditions during colonial um, encounters. But if we kind of unpack what customary law may actually mean within the context of, of the saltwater collection and Aboriginal um, peoples in, in Australia, the way um, how customary law has been conceptualized is that it is very important to show this kind of relational representation of how there is a link between people, environment and the law. And customary law is very much is something that is being performed, it's being part of people's um, daily lives and it's not something um, that is static, it's constantly kind of evolving and what is really very important in order to understand customary law, and if we are going to use customary law to make um, land right claims in um, ancestral uh, land titles, is that we, it's very difficult to show it in a kind of static way because it is something that is very dynamic. It's something that is being performed because it is a relation. Um, it needs to be kind of presented in that relational kind of form. And, um, that is something that I've been, from an empirical point of view, that I've experienced a lot in my own research in Southern Africa, is um, when I do research with the Sun peoples, you walk in that landscape, you experience through all your, and it's kind of an embodiment of, of that relationship between the person walking the landscape, um, you're actually walking um, the law, you're performing um, the law. So customary law is very much an embodied um, expression and that is obviously very different from how positivist law uh, presents um, sources and norms and, and validates uh, law. So it is these kind of clashes we have to uh, disentangle um, if we want to have a better understanding of um, customary law. Um, in terms of um, the maps um, that are sort of being produced as part of these ancestral um, land claims, um, which are a requirement under uh, the Native Title Act, we see that just as there is a kind of clash and friction between the different legal systems meeting, um, there is also a clash how these territories are being mapped as well. Um, and there is this kind of symbiotic relationship of this kind of friction between laws and, and maps that are being produced in, in some of these um, court cases. And obviously, there is, as, as I um, discussed a few minutes ago, claimants have to show uh, their ancestral uh, title, they have to map their relationship on the land. So that's what we kind of see in terms of the mapping of um, ancestral land. But likewise, defendants uh, will also um, represent their maps um, and often what they will, will map is how they've improved the land. 
uh, also with all the necessary boundaries and, and showing uh, a, partic a particular kind of tenure um, on the land. So we see that on these, on, on, these, on these maps, we see kind of two different kind of epistemologies and ontologies um, coming together. On the one hand, um, Aboriginal peoples showing um, their ancestral kind of belonging, um, which is being represented on the map in a very kind of embodied um, manner. And on the other hand, uh, we have this kind of relationship of positivist law within a particular kind of landscape that is all about um, the improvement of the land. And that kind of friction is obviously part of a whole um, kind of colonial history where both maps were being used as a kind of um, technical, uh, mechanical way um, to show um, the principle of, of terra nullius and res nullius, that a particular kind of territory where new settlers wanted to, um, to build a new home. This idea that, that these landscapes were empty, that there were no people residing, and that there were no, um, no laws because there were no people. Um, that was kind of being used um, as a narrative and, and visually being presented as, as kind of empty maps. Um, in order to, to be able to stake uh, claims and to claim uh, land rights over um, territories that were being um, colonized. So we see that that history of, of positivist law and, um, and the kind of cartographic representation of empty landscapes in order to justify colonization, that, that these kind of histories are really um, developing almost in, in a parallel um, way. But obviously, um, a lot of these maps that are being produced, um, even by indigenous peoples, um, because there is a certain requirement how the court wants to see these maps, and, and because, as I mentioned already before, within law, uh, positivist law is sort of hierarchically being seen as the more superior, um, the same kind of reflections can also be seen in, in some of the maps that are being produced as part of uh, native title claims. And um, so a lot of the maps that are being uh, produced and generated, um, they show certain silences, there are uh, certain ways of being in the landscapes that are not being reproduced in these typical uh, um, cartographic representations of land rights. And um, one of the problems that we see is that indigenous cartography is very much like indigenous uh, law is, is based on this very intricate kind of uh, relational epistemologies that are showing this, this relationship um, between ways of knowing uh, that are linked to um, kinship, that are linked to wider relations with um, the ancestors, with uh, with nature, with the environment, with landscapes, the knowledge that belongs to that landscape. All these, these relationships are, are, should, be re should be represented on, on these maps. But just as the law, um, positivist law, is kind of struggling to understand that kind of relational approach, the same with cartography, that it's really very difficult to show um, this kind of embodied understanding of these relationships. So, but we're also kind of dealing not just with kind of epistemological misrepresentation or even silences when we even don't start to um, map these, these relational approaches. We also see that the ontological relations um, on the maps are actually um, either erased or misrepresented. And that in terms of using maps in a useful way to underlie um, relational being within a particular kind of landscape, that we also need to have an active representation of these ontologies, of these ways of being in um, these landscapes. And what, you know, if, if this is an example of, of one of the maps that are being uh, produced um, to support um, ancestral land rights right claims and um, in the what is often being argued is if, if we start to problematize some of these maps is that they present this bird's eye view. 
and that these maps are very much, it's like a topographic representation of a particular kind of landscape. And we may have uh, certain points on the map that may have certain significance um, and where there may be stories behind these specific um, kind of locations. But we, it's still a very static representation of that landscape. It's very topographical and the whole map does not come um, alive. So there is a problem um, of the kind of perspective we're using when we are um, representing indigenous people's ways of being in the landscape, both in the law, but also in the map. So I've been doing more recently um, more research around how um, maybe um, theories are around art, but um, and uh, can actually maybe give us a different kind of language how we need to think about that relationship of how we're going to present um, indigenous peoples laws and relational being onto maps. And um, there's some really interesting work being done by an artist called um, McKinsey, a Canadian artist who uh, was originally a landscape um, artist and um, started to experiment more with different kind of perspectives and different techniques of painting um, to exactly draw um, her viewers more into, into that landscape by playing around with a more kind of, on the one hand, more abstract way of, um, of a landscape, but also overlaying it with different kind of structures, with different kind of narratives, and by um, rethinking her arts practice around landscape uh, painting in a more um, transformative manner and, and playing around with, with different ideas around uh, perspectivism. So her, her work actually um, starts to become far more abstract and there's multiple stories, multiple um, lines, multiple ways of being being represented um, in on these maps because she still, um, she, she represents these, these paintings actually as, um, as as maps, uh, and if I just go um, back to um, the previous map, I mean, I, I don't have to go into detail to show how different um, these maps uh, are. Uh, particularly, this map is really very, um, um, very interesting. It's part of um, a wider collection of maps where she actually is, is uh, sitting on the canvas um, with uh, people from First Nations and um, t they're telling their story of their ancestors and whilst they're telling their story they're actually performing that life, the relationships um, on the map but we also see that on these maps it's not just the, the stories of uh, Indigenous peoples but also um, the stories of of settlers, of colonialists, and how these stories start to enmesh and create new kind of relations, um, and um, how um, how there's different layers, different kind of stories emerging um, on these maps. So these, so there is a really interesting work um, being done around how we may need to think differently about what kind of perspective we're using to tell the story about our belonging to a particular kind um, of landscape. And that absolutely resonates with how indigenous peoples uh, and, and, and the case study that we're exploring in this presentation, it really resonates with how they see um, their own kind of relationship with the landscape and how that should be represented in a map. And art practice is very much part is an embodiment of, of the law, um, of these customary laws that we're trying to bring to the court and that we're trying to represent um, on the maps. And um, this quote from, from Morphe really speaks to the previous examples that I've shown, 
that uh, for the Yolmu people, art is a way of expressing knowledge, is a means of expressing the experience of being in the world and a means of communicating ideas and values. So the, the art practices of indigenous peoples, and I will show you examples um, in, in the next slides, they're all sort of, they depict a kind of how humans, non-humans, and more than humans, how they live in, in, in that particular kind of landscape, how they are related um, to each other and how they share this kind of sacred knowledge to be in that particular kind of place in a particular kind of way. So in that sense, Aboriginal art is not just art in um, sort of um, in an aesthetic kind of uh, sense or an aesthetic kind of theory from a Western um, uh, point of view, but Aboriginal art is actually also a source and an expression of, of their laws because it really shows this kind of ontological connection between law and um, landscape. And so this is something that I will unpack further in the case study of the saltwater um, collect, um, collection. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with um, um, the court case of the Yongmu people, um, so the wider kind of legal context is that um, although the um, Aboriginal Land Rights Act of uh, 76 was actually um, giving ownership over land down to the low water mark, but the question of sea ownership was not um, specified in the Aboriginal Land Rights Act of 76. And a similar issue uh, was also in the Native Title Act of 93, that exclusive uh, possession of um, Aboriginal sea estates uh, was not recognized. Although um, Native Title rights over water and land was, was recognized in the Native Title Act, but in terms of um, the resource management, um, that the was not being recognized as being um, exclusively um, for Aboriginal peoples, so in terms of having rights over fishing, etc. And um, a particular um, sort of the, the, a, a more specific uh, issue that really led to 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 this court case was um, that. Um, the Yolna people found an illegal fishing camp um, in 96 on their sacred land in the uh, Blue Mud Bay. And what was really a sort of very important part of that was that they found the severed head of a crocodile, which in um, the Yolna people's um, um, tradition, um, the crocodile is their, their ancestor, which they call um, their um, varu. So that really prompted um, the court case. And as part of um, the, the court case um, and the requirement to show uh, the, the, the titles, the legal titles to um, um, to, to the water and, and to the natural resources. Um, the, some of the elders decided to um, present their, their artwork as, uh, as law and they started to create um, the paintings on, on the bark paintings to show that spiritual, spiritual relationship with the water and it's in that spiritual relationship that we see the law um, emerging. And how by, by going deep into their culture, um, through the practice of art, they were actually performing the rituals again through that, that art uh, practice. So whilst painting and carving on the, um, on the barks, the, the, the rituals were kind of reenacted, they were um, performed um, that really showed this kind of social relationships, how the seas were being managed um, by the ancestors um, and by uh, the current claimants. So these, um, these bark paintings are becoming the kind of title deeds in a way um, of how um, the people belonged to the sea and that we start to see 
that this that, that that these park paintings are not just a painting, but that they're actually um, the evidence of customary marine uh, tenure. And obviously, that creates again this kind of friction and tension between um, different kind of tenures um, and how tenure is being conceptualized in positivist law and through um, these bark paintings. So just to unpack that a little bit um, further, so if we would keep using that language of maps and um, Helen Watson has done um, a lot of research on this and she refers to the bark paintings at, in, um, in the vernacular uh, Dulan um, and she, she really writes uh, and shows nicely how when uh, she deconstructs these um, the, the bark paintings and and the symbolisms uh, that we see being depicted um, in in these in these forms and, and and the relationships that are being represented that actually um, these these maps of ancestral land titles because that's what and sea titles that's what they actually are is that they actually show uh, the footsteps of the ancestors. And uh, what they are showing are the song lines of two, uh, of the two um, major ancestors, the Duwa and the Jiwacha, and how they represent two um, separate um, kind of social, um, social networks, each with their own kind of um, clans with their own ancestors and with their own kind of relationships and with their own kind which start to form their own kind of primary level um, of ownership so these 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 maps that we see here in in, in front of us uh, show each um you know the, the the two major song lines in in, in the sea, in these sea landscapes um, and the relationships between um, the current um, um, the, the current generation and how through these song lines, how through this dreaming, they have these connections with um, their ancestors and with the spirits and with um, with the animals um, and um, with, the, with, with the wider natural world. And these song lines and the, the, the dreamings, they become um, the evidence of that kind of extended ownership that resides in these um, social networks. So we really see in, in these uh, Dulan, we see the, the kind of relational experiences of how people relate to, to the seas, to the natural resources being performed through the paintings, through the lines, through uh, the symbolisms, uh, which are more than just symbolisms, they really come alive. They start to represent the ancestors, the relationships um, with with the wider um, human, non-human, um, and more than human world are really being performed um, on um, these maps. So we see that um, these these maps, these these park bark paintings are becoming an expression of their um, sea rights. And that these sea rights really originate from, from creative beings who have shaped the seas, the two major ancestors who created these two song lines, where people belong to these song lines. They are the, the, the creators of, um, of the sea rights, of how they've shaped um, the sea. And the Yolma people rights and their responsibilities for the, for, for the beaches, the reefs, the seabeds, the, the sea life, um, the waters and joining their lands, um, the, the spiritual kind of connections between these different um, kind of worlds of, of the ancestors and, 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 the, the, and, and the Yolma people can actually be seen in the shimmering waters. So there is this Kind of representation of, of the shimmering waters that represent um, the sea rights, which we see here in, in this picture. So in a way, the Yolnu laws are really being found in, can, can be found in, in, the, in, in the shimmerings of the water. It's in the reefs, in the barriers, in the waters, the channels, the rocks, etc., that we see the law being, being written. Um, 
and it's that that knowledge of these connections the relations that are embedded in the shimmerings of the water that are stored in the Onyo people's memories in the stories that they pass on from generation to generation that we see that these song lines are being kept alive um, that the, the the sea rights the the, the title deeds over the dc rights the the, the rights over the the, the fish or it's and rights not necessarily the right kind of word it's more that kind of relationships they have with um with the fish etc um, is all kind of connected in that kind of material relationships that is being developed between the Yolngu peoples and and the kind of material forces that are part of um of of that particular sea um of, of these seascapes it's the the life cycles the seasons the sea tides bringing different kind of shimmerings bringing different kind of movements in that relationship between water land etc um, is kind of really embedded in these stories is embedded in 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 the dreamlines song lines uh, with the ancestors and that these are the your new uh, laws this is kind and this is kind of embedded in these um bark paintings that are being reformed um, reinscribed in a way in um, in these paintings so the the bark paintings are actually a kind of tapestry a weaving of um, of the laws of the sacred designs of of the Olnu. and this quote of the Olnu elder really captures this very nicely um, that um, although there is we, we you know we see um, a crocodile, a necklace, a spear, etc. That actually, that we should not sort of over um, emphasize the icon, the, the over emphasize it, that they're a kind of icon, but that they're more than just an icon. That they actually show a particular kind of creature, and that they are showing a cloud, a rock, a fire, a spear, or a rope. And that is. Um, part of a wider depiction of an ancestral being as well as its action and that it also includes a kind of code for relations between people places and things so we do not just see um, a crocodile we do not just see a spare we see a whole performance a whole action of these relational um, the relational being um, that comes together um, in that particular kind of moment, in that particular kind of icon where the, the human, the non-human and more than human are performing these relational um, um, rituals in a way um, that are then forming uh, a sacred des design and within that design we start to see um, the codes um, how to live together how to nurture these these relationships these are the codes of how to fish these are the codes of how to have a very um symbiotic relationships uh, between humans non-humans and um, more than humans and this was actually being recognized in the high court um and that actually this the, the Yolnu's ownership over the intertidal zone was actually um, recognized in the court case by using these um, these bark paintings and that has been a really very important uh, moment for aboriginal peoples um, in uh, australia and just to kind of labor that point uh, how i started off the, the the presentation of these very different um, legal traditions is if we compare how if if we look into um you know sea rights and the law of the sea how that kind of performativity of the salt water collection what i've just explained if and and that relationship to what according to um the law of the sea uh, what we would maybe um, describe as territorial um extension of territorial rights um and how that is being depicted um, in the law of the sea um, and um, how um, the territorial sea is um, it may not be very clear on on the slide uh, but in a very kind of um, typical cartographic um, 
kind of manner. Um, not coming alive for indigenous peoples um, at all of what's actually of these relationships that are happening um, in these territorial seas. And this is, you know, this could just as be a territorial sea as well. So we see really very nicely here in these two, um, uh, two images, two, two maps, um, two very different laws being um, depicted and being um, performed as well. And on my left hand, um, um, Law of the Sea, um, uh, sort of depicting, embodying a very positivist understanding um, of law with clear demarcations, which comes with certain um, rights of ownership um, and, and certain property rights which are also very conceptualized within a particular kind of property paradigm. And on the other hand, we have um, here on the right hand side, a very different understanding of that relationship between ownership, property, belonging to the sea, which is more of a performative approach, more of a, a custodianship um, and, and, and this kind of higher relations of between humans, non-humans, and um, more than humans. And sort of the last point that I would like to make is that um, for me, um, when I have to um, sort of define um, customary law, and, and I've been studying this for, for more than 15 years, I think more and more I have a deeper understanding about the importance of the performative element and um, for the lawyers who, who, who may be um, watching this, this presentation um, may be familiar with, um, you know, if, if there's different ways how we theorize about what is law and one way is to think about a Grund norm and Kelsen's approach that there is this kind of higher norm um, which could be in the constitution, which could be in statutes, which makes law law. Um, but what I would like to make an argument for is that customary law that we should be seeing as a, as a performance, as a performativity, um, should actually also be a grunt norm and should also be, be accepted as, um, as a source um, of law. And I just would like to refer to um, one other um, important um, formativity of the law, which is the Nguru Ruda canvas. And um, actually in this particular court case, the judges, because this is a really very big um, canvas. And um, when the artists, the Aboriginal artists were painting each their own territory uh, on this massive canvas, when that was being um, presented to the judges, the judges actually had to take off their shoes and walk through the landscape. They were actually forming together with um, the Aboriginal people, um, the law. They were actually immersing themselves in that landscape. They were embedding themselves and performing the law um, on the canvas. So I just would like to end with um, a quote from um, a paper that I just recently um, finished. And um, for me, um, customary law within the context of, of this um, particular kind of, um, um, you know, of this particular kind of uh, court case and, and the canvas that we see in front of us, for more the law is actually in the paintbrushes and the performativity of applying the acrylics that the law starts to appear on the canvas. It, it appears the law not as some kind of um, static representation of a particular kind of norm, but it's a dialogue. It's a point of, it becomes like a point of reference. The law becomes a, a, a dialogue between all these different ways of being, uh, all these relationships that are being performed and embedded um, on this canvas between humans, non-humans, and more than humans. Thank you.